from Boston, Crockett's Victory Garden. Welcome to Crockett's Victory Garden. As you remember from last week, I said that I was going to talk about soil preparation today, and this is certainly one of the easiest ways to do it with a rototiller. Now, this is a machine that you can rent or you can buy, or you can have someone come in and rototill your garden. It really prepares the soil so that it's beautifully soft, well homogenized, and it's easy for plants to grow in it. Well, today, besides soil preparation, I'm going to, I'm going to plant some vegetables, seeds. I'm going to transplant some vegetables. I'm going to plant a grapevine and a clump of rhubarb, something that you would be able to pick year after year. Now, I should say that there are really two basics in growing vegetables, and one is sunshine. Now, you either have it or you haven't, and if you don't have sunshine, don't try to grow vegetables. But the other one is within your control, and that is the soil preparation. Last year, I had thousands of questions. So many of them come right down to the fact that the soil was not prepared properly in the first place. I should say that there is really no way that I can tell by looking at soil so although I've gardened for many, many years, no way I can tell whether that soil is rich or uh, infertile or whether it's acid or alkaline. There is one way to tell, however, and that is with a soil test. Now, I would advise that you buy an inexpensive soil test kit. Now, they come all the way from uh, 3 or $4 up to many times that, mostly uh, the, the more expensive ones give a greater number of tests. There's more reagent in them. The chief thing is I want to find out what is in the soil and today I want to concentrate not upon the nutrients but upon the acidity alkalinity balance of the soil. According to uh, an agronomist the soil can be very acid or very alkaline. What we want for vegetable is something just about halfway in between. Somewhere, if you talk about pH, about 6.0 to 6.8. The way to tell is with using a soil test kit such as this, which comes, as you see, with these vials in it and the various reagents. You take uh, a vial, as I did yesterday in this type, put some soil in it, and some reagent in it. And then when the, the moisture settles, when the sediment settles out of the water, you compare the colors. Now, according to that test right there, my soil is very close to seven. Should be an excellent soil for growing vegetables. What you want to put on your soil to, in order to make it come out that way, if you live in the eastern half of the country, is ground limestone. Now, ground limestone is only limestone rock which has been pulverized so that it will form a good close contact with the soil. Uh, lime is, excuse me, is lime is not a fertilizer but it acts as a sort of a catalyst. Uh, the fertilizer that you add to the soil is much more available to the plants if the acidity alkalinity balance is about right. Now in most parts of the country east of the Mississippi if you haven't put lime on your soil in the last three and a half years, then you should scatter it on the soil so it looks like a small snowfall, about three and a half to five pounds to a hundred square feet. If you live in the western part of the country, say uh, Arizona, for example, where the soil is naturally alkaline, you'd use sulfur. Again, the ground agricultural sulfur, about one to two pounds to a hundred square feet and dig them into the soil, preferably in the fall, but even in the spring if you haven't put it on previously. And any soil which has not had one of these additives for the last three years, I'm sure, even though you never took a soil test, you would you'd do well if you added one of these materials to the soil. The next thing that a soil needs is organic matter. Now the organic matter could be uh, leaves or manure, or it could be uh, old decayed sawdust, but probably the material most widely available throughout the country is plain peat moss. Now peat moss is acid, has an acid reaction, just marvelous um, organic material. Now when you add peat moss to a uh, light sandy soil, 
It acts as a sponge, holds moisture, which would ordinarily go through, keeps the nutrients from just going right out of sight. Now, when you add this to a heavy clay soil, it opens up the clay soil so the air gets in and the excess water drains away. It's, if there's a miracle ingredient in gardening, it has to be organic matter. Put it on your soil, roughly uh, three inches deep if you haven't used it before, and dig that into the soil. That is a, a great, great material. Peat moss, you can get it at any garden center in the country. Now let's talk about digging. Well, you saw the easy way, using a rototiller. Now I'm gonna show you a little more difficult way, but I'm gonna show you the easy way to do it. First, I'll show you the hard way. Use a spading fork where you've gardened before. Now if you do such as I'm doing right now, this is the hard way. You see, I'm moving soil way out into that whole area, and that is heavy going. You go to lift something like that up, especially if you put it back in the same hole, because you end up every time lifting a great hunk of soil, and that's hard work. What I like to do is, as I've done right over here, make a sort of a vertically vertical-sided trench. Then you can reach, take a small bite at a time. You're not lifting anything in the front. All you're lifting is what you have. Throw it up on the side like that. Give it a couple of cracks. Glad to see angleworms like that crawling in my garden. It's like that. Give it a crack. This is the easy, easy way to do it. But for goodness sakes, don't do all of your digging in one Saturday afternoon. For one thing, it's very tiring. Secondly, it's not smart because you should dig only what you're going to plant. That is, dig now, plant your early crops. Uh, when the time comes to uh, to plant your warm weather crops, then dig over another part of your garden. It could very well be that you're going to start your garden right out in the middle of your back lawn where there's plenty of sunshine and you have sod to contend with. Well, a spading fork is not the tool. In this instance, we want a spade, a flat bottom spade, which has been sharpened with a file. And then you can walk up to the sod and just jab it in like that, cut it over like this, and then you may, two or three ways you can do it. One, you can go under it like this, take this to one side, put it on your compost pile. But I should say, depends upon how much soil you have in here, how much topsoil. If you, after you've taken this up, you only have an inch or two of topsoil left, then I would tip that over and bury it as deeply as I could. In other words, flip your sod over, get it down deep where it will decay. Otherwise, this is great stuff to use in your compost pile, it will rot down during the year and improve the compost. Now, another way, of course, is to use a rototiller. Uh, three or four passes with a rototiller will do a pretty good job, but I stay, it's a, you'll end up with all of these fist-sized clods all through it and they'll plague you all summer long. Now I want to go over to another section and just peek how I do some intercropping as early in the season as this. If you see here, we have a lettuce and a cauliflower. A lettuce and a cauliflower, a lettuce and a cauliflower. Right on down here. The cauliflower, I planted about 18 inches apart with a lettuce in between. Cauliflower is a slow growing crop the lettuce is a fast growing crop. So I'm gonna have this lettuce picked before the cauliflower is big enough to touch uh, each other. Now you've seen how I've planted them, and I'm gonna plant a couple more here and talk about the plants that I'm putting in. First of all, let me show you a little trick on handling a trowel. Don't use it like that. That's the hardest way in the world to use a trowel. Act as though you mean business. Just grasp it in your hand, jab it in the ground like that. Push it away from you, pull it back, and you have a perfect hole to put your plant into. Now this is the kind of a plant I like to set out. Started this plant six weeks ago. Sturdy, good color on the foliage, and you notice where I plant it. I'm gonna bring the soil just up beneath those lower leaves. I'm gonna go right down into here with it. Firm it in quite well. Then 
This little contraption is a collar made of a piece of cardboard two and a half inches wide and 12 inches long pulled over and stapled. Long before the summer is gone, that cardboard will have decayed. But in the meantime, it's a barrier to keep the cutworms off. Now the cutworms aren't very apt to touch the lettuce, but they certainly do like cauliflower. And so here now we're gonna put in a lettuce. This, that uh, cauliflower, by the way, is uh, a snow crown, a nice one. And this lettuce is Black Seeded Simpson. Black Seeded Simpson's been around for 100 years and is still one of the greatest varieties going. Now let's move up to this end of the row. And up here I have a combination of uh, this broccoli, which is called premium crop, and a dark leaf lettuce called ruby. And so we have another broccoli and another lettuce right on down. Up here, we'll start in with a nice little plant. Husky little seedlings. This is the kind of thing I like, not those leggy ones. Husky ones like that, and your plants will be off and growing very, very rapidly. Again, slip a collar on them like that. Keep those cutworms away. You don't need any spray to do that. Now we'll put in a lettuce at the end of the row. Very, very simple. Now, I want to get these plants off to a flying start. I'm going to mix a little wa any little water-soluble fertilizer in the water. Give them a drink. Give them one good drink like that. And they're off and growing. That's all there is to it. Now, let's go across here to the other end of the garden. I have two kinds of cabbages. Here again, put in with some lettuce. The lettuce variety is buttercrunch. Great, great variety. This one, uh, this is ruby ball, a, a cabbage, 18 inches, with lettuce in between. Again, you see, long before this season is advanced at all, I'm gonna have two crops out of this row. When these cabbages come out in the middle of the summer, oh, maybe I'll put in a row of beans, or maybe I'll even put in a row of peas for the fall. Shows that you don't have to just plant your garden one time and think that you're through. Again, we'll just slip this little fellow out of here. This is butter crunch. It won't go a long way to find a better leaf lettuce than butter crunch. Those little seedlings, I said before, six weeks old from seed. Here I have another cabbage known as Savoy King. It's a mid-season variety, a little bit uh, smaller plants than the others, but nice husky ones. This is a very high quality cabbage. It's, uh, the name Savoy means that the leaves themselves are crinkled. It gives you a very high quality vegetable. Here again, I have some uh, Black Seeded Simpson. This variety was listed in seed catalogs 100 years ago. Still perfectly delicious. Hard to beat something like that. Now those will get a drink of water and they're off and growing. Remember that those are crops that can stand cold weather. Now another crop that can stand cold weather are peas. And first thing I'd like you to look at is the trench that I've made. About four inches deep and about six inches wide and flat bottomed. Now what I'm gonna do here is to sow the peas very thickly. You won't really get much out of the peas unless until you put a lot of them in. Uh, also, when they're growing close together, they're somewhat self-supporting. Now this is a variety called uh, Oregon sugar pea. It's an edible potted pea. I'm gonna moisten that. I'm gonna moisten the pea seeds show you another little trick on how to handle them. Moisten them like this and then I'm going to add a legume inoculant. Now this comes under several names. It's a little black powder which is a bacteria which will allow peas or beans to take nitrogen 
right out of the atmosphere for free and you don't have to put the fertilizer in the ground. So you see how thickly I'm putting them in. In some places, the seeds will practically touch one another. In other places, they may be an inch apart. Don't be stingy when you plant peas. If you want a good crop of peas, you've got to put them in the ground, just like that. So easy to do. Now, this uh, we haven't had rain here for some time. This soil is a little dry. So I'm glad to get these peas planted down in the soil to this depth with the, the peas themselves about four inches down into the ground. Now you'll notice that when we come to covering them, I'm going to cover them just about an inch deep, just like that. Next thing, when you cover peas or any of these, any seeds, tap it down, just like that. That makes a good firm contact between the soil and the seeds. Now I have, I have them down low in the trench. As the season advances and they grow, I'll pull soil in from the sides and fill this up level. That way, the peas roots themselves will be way down into the soil. Hoe is a very good tool for this. Pull it across like that. We have rocks in this garden, as you can see. Plenty of rocks. This time of year to get your peas planted. Get them in if you haven't planted them yet. We have two or three varieties already planted. This one is an edible potted one. And uh, this part of the country will be sowing another crop of peas in late summer. And we'll harvest in the fall. Hate to see a person plant a garden once and think that he's done it for the season. Just isn't true. Now, I'm going to go across here and look at some uh, onion seedlings, which I planted yesterday. You can see they're, they're about four or five inches apart. Four different varieties. I want to get some really good sized onions out of here. And the first thing I want to talk about is on my root crops, I like to add this material called diazinon, a white powder which is great for controlling root maggots. Now, they don't get on everything, but oh, they, um, they're terrible. A lot of us have just quit growing some of the root, some of the root crops simply because of the, uh, the root maggots we, we're making like life too miserable. Sprinkle a little on the soil. Doesn't take much. This is a sifter top can, as you can see. Now for the onion seedlings, which was started about six weeks ago, inside, this is what I like to see. Nice root system. Beautiful root system on here. Now that plant is, going, is eager to grow. And all we do, remind that old trick, push that old spade down, uh, trowel down as though you mean business. Get those roots down into the ground. Plant one like that. Take another one of these. That will give you some early onions, good ones. And of course, they're very inexpensive because you're growing them all from seed. Now you notice that, I, that the soil was moist where I planted those. Now, I'm, where I transplanted, now I'm going to sow some seeds. And the soil here is dry. There's an old adage in gardening that you sow dry and set wet. Very hard to handle soil when it's wet and gummy. I'm going to plant in this row carrots and some radishes. And I'll show you why we do the radishes in a minute. Carrots, a, ver a variety called Nance Half Long. Grow about six inches tall, or long, I should say. Now, it doesn't take very many of these, but carrot, there's enough in the package to do a 30-foot roll. I'd be sure I want to get some plants coming up, and I can always thin them. Now, carrots take as much as three weeks to come up. Therefore, I can, just can't afford to wait that long and not know where those plants are. Well, that's, this is my answer. I spill some radish seeds. But radishes are what I want to put in here. They'll be up in a week and mark the spot. 
So I can cultivate on both sides and I know very well where the carrots are going to be for later. Again, I'm getting two crops from the same row. I'm going to have my radish in a month. We'll follow that along with carrots. Now next to it, I'm putting in some beets. I have two other varieties of beets in this row. This one is called Detroit Dark Red. The color on these beets seeds is captan to keep them from rotting in the ground. I like to drop a seed, about one seed about every inch. Now there will be several plants come up. I'll be able to thin them out and transplant some of them. Uh, beets are one of the few crops that you can transplant without any trouble. Few root crops, I should say. About a half inch deep. Pat them down, give those a drink of water, and they're ready to go. Now, you notice I have a board down there, so I don't compact the soil where I walk. Next thing we're gonna do is to plant this clump of rhubarb, and this is what you might get from your garden center. A rhubarb plant started, and you can get the roots in the fall, and they're perfectly dormant. Sometimes you can get dormant roots in the spring. I dug a pretty good size hole here, about 18 inches across, 18 inches deep. I've added some peat moss, and I added a fertilizer, that slow release fertilizer called Osmocoat. You see this Osmocoat name on it, and that's what it looks like. Those little granules will slowly uh, work their way, uh, release the nourishment throughout the season. This is a long-term crop. Now, we may be able to keep the soil on that ball. There we are. Now, your rhubarb ought to go. So it's just about at the soil level. Maybe the crown could be one inch down. No more than that. I don't want them to go too deep. Now the next thing is, get your foot right up close to the plant here and step on it. Just like that. Then, make a little depression all around here to hold moisture. Now, you can take your hose, give the plants a good drink of water. Now, rhubarb is a vegetable which belongs over on one side of your garden because you plant it once and don't have to replant it for several years. Well, I said we we're going to plant a grapevine. And with a grapevine, we're talking about something that goes for generations. So I dug a hole two feet across, two feet deep. And I'll tell you, I took out a bushel of rocks and clay and poor, poor soil. In there, I mixed peat moss and some good loam. And I'm going to splurge. I'm going to use some of my compost. That's the greatest stuff. Last year, that was bean stalks and corn stalks and old leaves and such mixed together here. And if there's not a plant going, not one that can resist compost. And that compost will dig down into the soil here. We're getting ready now to plant a grapevine, which will be there for years and years and years. Now that one, we start there and we'll go back to this grapevine which I've had healed in here just to keep the roots moist. This is called a two-year-old grapevine, and you know, it's, it doesn't look like much. Very, very poor looking, but it does have some root systems. Uh, system, it's grown from a cutting. Now, all you do with something like this is to open a trench and set that little fella in just about like that. Again, use your foot. Firm that soil so that the roots have a good contact with the soil. Make a little depression around that to add water. And I have a little container of water here. Now that plant is ready to go. Now comes the crucial part. 
Doesn't look like much. All I want to get from that plant this year is one cane to grow up this fence four or five feet tall. So what I'm going to do, first of all, cut off that dead stub. You can tell when it's dead, when it's brown like that. And I'm going to cut off these side shoots like that. And I'm going to cut this plant back, in this instance, to about here. There is one good shoot growing, which I'm going to allow to go up the fence. And that's all there is to planting a grapevine. And it certainly doesn't look like much at this stage in the game, but that's how you do it when you plant grapes. Now, I was hoping we'd get a little time for some questions today. By the way, you can see the, the peas and onions and things growing here beautifully. Easter is just ahead of us, too. And I have a little Easter lily, which I planted here on the 2nd of December. And here, four or five days before Easter, it looks as if it's going to make it. We'll have Easter lilies for Easter. Something you can do on your own windowsill without any problem at all. Now, let me answer a couple of questions. Mark Allman said, what kind of vegetables can I plant uh, in an area that gets only one or two hours of sunlight a day? Well, Mr. Allman, I'd say plant wildflowers because it's going to be tough to grow vegetables. You might plant a few. Uh, you might get by with some lettuce. Wouldn't be very strong, but you can plant some lettuce. And uh, you might get by with some pumpkins, but most vegetables won't do well. Uh, Denise Humbertson says, the winter has broken the larger branches of my fits of junipers. Can I tape or repair these? Will they be damaged forever? No, you can't tape them or repair them. You'll have to cut them back. Cut them back to the point of damage, and Fitz's, fortunately, will send out new growth. So you'll have a nice plant. It may take you a couple of years before you, uh, you can, they will make their, their new growth again. Well, that's all I have time for today. Now, on my next program, I'm going to plant some raspberries and strawberries, good vegetable uh, fruits for your garden. And I'm going to set out some gladiolus corns. And though it's barely here, I'm going to plant some sweet corn. That's right here on Crockett's Victory Garden. I hope you enjoy the program every week.